Hi guys, in this video, we will be looking at transportation, transshipment, and assignment, specifically at transportation. A transportation model is a special type of linear programming problem, which is part of a larger class of linear programming problems called network flow models. The characteristics of a network of a transportation model is that a product is transported from a number of sources to a number of destination and the objective of a transportation model is to minimize the cost of transportation the other characteristic of a transportation model is that each source is able to supply a fixed number of units of the product and each destination has a fixed demand for the product. Previously, we looked at the assignment model, and the assignment model is a type of transportation model. Uh, the difference is that in the assignment model, each source is able to just is able to supply just one unit, and each destination is able to receive just one unit. But in a transportation model, a source can supply any fixed number of units and the destination could receive any fixed number of units as well. Um, as an example, we have a question given a transportation problem with the following cost, supply and demand. So in this matrix or in this table, we have three sources namely a b c and we have three destinations one two and three what the table is telling us is that to transport one unit from a to one the cost is six dollars to transport one unit from A to two, the cost is $7 and so on and so forth. So these nine values here represents the cost matrix, which is the cost of transporting one unit from each of these source to each of these destination. On this side of the table, we have the supply, and what this 100 tells us is that source A is able to supply a maximum of 100 units of the product. Source B is able to supply 180 units and source C 200 units. And then at the bottom here, we have the demand. Destination 1 demands 135 units of the product. Destination 2 demands 175 units of the product, and Destination 3 demands 170 units of the product. So, first question is to draw the transportation network for the problem. And the second question is to formulate the transportation model. We take each one in turn. We begin with the first question to draw the transportation network for the problem. A transportation network is made up of two, essentially two parts. We have nodes which are represented by circles and the nodes actually represent the sources and the destination. So locations, for example, um, are represented by the nodes. And then we have arcs or as we call them lines and these arcs or lines represent a path between two nodes. So to begin, we start by drawing a node for our three sources, A, B, and C, and note for our three destinations, one, two, and three. Then we can start by writing supply on one side and demand on the other side. A is able to supply 100 units, B 180 units, and C 200 units. And that will give us a total supply 
of 480 units. On the other side, one destination one demands 135 units, destination two demands 175 units, and destination three demands 170 units. And that gives us a total of, again, 480 units. At this point, I would like to mention that because the supply equals to demand, this type of transportation problem is called a balance transportation problem. And what it is, balance transportation problem means that the supply is equal to the demand. And in a balance problem, because these two things are equal to each, uh, because these two amounts are equal, we don't have any shortages or surpluses. If the supply was greater than the demand, or if the demand was greater than the supply, then we would have an unbalanced transportation problem with shortages or with surpluses. The next part, so we have one part down, which we have our nodes and then the supply and demand. The next thing we would like to do is to insert, it says here that A can transport from, to, can transport to destination one, two, and three because these are the costs associated with going from one, two, and three respectively. So we draw an arc from A to one and then we insert the unit cost of going from A to one. So six dollars is the cost for transporting one unit of this product from source a to destination one then we draw an arc from source a to destination two and it takes seven dollars to transport one unit of the product from source a to destination two and then we have another arc from source A to destination 3 and it takes four dollars to transport one unit of the product from source A to destination 3. Um, as a homework I want you guys to complete this transportation network diagram by drawing nodes from B to, to destinations 1, 2 and 3 and filling in the cost per unit and the same thing for destination uh, from source C to destination 3. Moving on, we have the second question, formulate the transportation model. Now, because the transportation model is a type of linear programming problem, this model is going to be made up of the three components of a linear programming problem, which we looked at in our first class. And to recall, it's the, the, the model is made up of decision variables, it's made up of the objective function, and it's made up of constraints. So we begin with our decision variables. And our decision variables, we write it in this form, x, i, comma, j, which represents the number of units of the product. We don't know the name of the product. Uh, if the question gives us the name of the product, then we'll just insert that here. Uh, number of units to be transported from source i to destination j. So what this notation means is that this first letter i, we can replace that with a, b, or c, and we can replace the letter j with 1, 2, and 3. So if we take i to be b, and we take j to be 3, then we read it as x represents the number of units to be transported from source b to destination 3. Likewise, if we replace i with a and we replace j with 2, we read it as the number of units to be transported from source a to destination 2. So, this is how, this is always how we'll be writing the decision variable and this, rather than writing each one of those things individually, a to one, a to two, a to three, and then b to one, so on and so forth, we can just capture all of those, 
all of those information in this in the in this wording in this notation that we use here secondly we want the objective function and remember the objective of a transportation model is to minimize cost so we begin by writing min c which means to minimize cost now in this function here we have our total cost is basically going to be equal to 6 times the number of units transported from source A to destination 1. Remember, recall that this 6 is that 6 there and it is the cost per unit. The cost per unit of transporting one unit of this good from or, or this product from source A to destination 1. So if this is the cost per unit, we multiply it by the number of units that we are transporting, and that's going to give us the total cost of transporting how much ever unit of the good that we put here from source A to destination 1. Then we have 7 times the number of units that's transported from source A to destination 2, and we have 4 times the number of units transported from source A to destination 3. We do the same with B, and here I have a plus sign, which means uh, the part for C is missing, so I want you to fill that in. Um, complete the objective function. In total, there should be nine terms, uh, three for A, three for B, and three for C, so you have to fill in the three missing terms. And finally, we have our constraints. And our constraints, we can divide them into three parts here. We can have our supply constraints, our demand constraints, and as always, our non-negativity constraints. We begin with our supply constraints. Our first supply constraint is that the number of units going from A to 1 plus the number of units that goes from A to 2 plus the number of units that go, goes from A to 3 must be equal to 100. So A can supply no more than 100 units. So the amount that goes from A to 1, A to 2, and A to 3 must add up to 100 units. So if you notice, the, this first part here is where we're going from and the second part is where we're going to and in this case all of these first terms are a so it means that we're going from a to one then from a to two then from a to three and we should get a total of 100 units and then we do the same for b the total that the total supply of b is 180 units that's why we have this 180 here so we're going from b to one b to two and b to three and then we have for C, but I don't have it here, so it's for you, it's an exercise for you to complete. Insert the supply constraint for going from C to 1, C to 2, C to 3. Then we can look at our demand constraints, and in our demand constraints, this, in our supply constraints, we're going across the rows, so A to 1, A to 2, A to 3. B to 1, B to 2, B to 3, and C to 1, C to 2, C to 3. In the demand constraints, you're coming down the column, each column instead. So rather than saying A to 1, you say A to, A to 1, B to 1, and C to 1. So the second in our demand constraints, the second term does not change. 1 demands a total of 135 units, and 1 can get this demand satisfied by collecting units from A, from B, or from C. So we say that the number of units that go from A to 1, plus the number of units that go from B to 1, plus the number of units that goes from C to 1, so that's the total number of units that goes to 1, must be equal to 135. How is this different from what's written at the top here? This is saying that the number of units that go from A to 1, A to 2, and A to 3. So this represents the number of units that's going from, the total number of units that goes 